having me. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Sloan. I'm a distinguished visitor, uh, visiting scholar in the math department here at Rutgers. And I've always been interested in sequences of numbers. And I'm going to show you a few really exciting ones today, uh, some of which are extremely relevant to today. The, 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 this particular one started back at Los Alamos Laboratories in the 50s, and it, they were studying the way, I think they were probably studying the way explosions spread, um, uh, explosions go very, very quickly, and so it's hard to see what's actually going on. So let's make a much simpler model. This is a model, uh, an artificial model, where we have squares, and each square is either on or off. And you could think of this as a virus spreading through a network of, of towns or people. And the way it works is we start off this one infected cell, which is blue, and um, or it's in the, the, the one state, and it infects its neighbors. It's four, each cell has four neighbors, and uh, it infects its neighbors. But the rule is you only get infected if exactly one of your neighbors is infected. So that square there is not going to get infected because it's got two infected neighbors. If you've got two infected or more, then somehow a defense mechanism kicks in and you don't get infected. But if you're exposed to just one infected cell, then you get infected. So that turned on four, and then that will, each one of them will turn on the three around it, and it keeps going. And the question is, how many infected cells do we have after a certain number of generations? You can see here, we've just added 12 cells and the total has gone up to 21. There are two sequences running simultaneously. One is the number of new infections and the other is the total number of infections. In this particular version, once you're infected, you stay infected. This is a very oversimplified model of a particular kind of process. And I began with this one because we can actually analyze this one. So the next one, each of these is outer ones is gonna turn on um, one cell and then there, and let me run it for a bit. And you can see that there's a pattern that repeats. We just went by 16 generations and it started growing again from the corners. And that happens every time we get to a power of two. Now we just went through 32 generations. We're coming up to 64 generations and it grows each time it grows from the corners in a, in a predictable manner. So this is actually quite easy to analyze. On the other hand, if you change the rules slightly, it gets much more difficult. That was the Ulam Warburton cellular automaton. It's a, really a little computer played on two dimensional on a two dimensional grid. And the, if we change the rules and make the grid hexagonal, so now we're looking at what you might see on a bathroom floor, which is tiled with hexagonal tiles, but we play the same game. One of these hexagons gets infected and it infects its neighbors. And again, you get infected if exactly one of your neighbors is infected and it grows like this and the numbers, you can see the two sequences, they're different this time. And when we run it, something very strange happens. Again, once you get to a power of two, it grows a little bit more, it grows from the corners. The trouble is what happens at the corners after what did we just went by 64 generations is different from what happened at 32 generations. And so this is very hard to analyze. I've spent a lot of time staring at this and it is, has basically defeated me for the moment. Um, it's now growing again from the corners. And if you stare at it, you see that the pattern of un, um, uninfected cells, the white patterns is different at each power of two. So there's no recurrence known for that. So let me now show you, oh, there's one more I want to show you. Reset, I want to go to the Schrant Ulam cellular automaton. This is also done on the square grid. It's a slightly different set of rules, but basically the same except for some small changes. And if we look at it, it grows rather like the first one, but it's different. And 
we have not been able to analyze it. And Ulam himself couldn't analyze it. So let me switch over now to my slides. So, um, Neil, I real quick, do we do we know like what proportion of cells are infected after a certain number of steps? Does it tend to some constant? It does for the for for some of them, but others, uh, I think probably you can guess. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I want to switch over to my official talk here and to share. And I must remember to do play slideshow. Okay, so um, here's the talk. And I, I, I'm going to talk about, as I said, I'm going to talk about some really exciting, interesting uh, sequences, some of which are very, very new. And all of them are basically unsolved. And the Ulam Warburton and the other cellular automaton I mentioned. And if you want to see them for yourselves, go to the toothpick entry, enter toothpicks in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, the OAIS in the search window, and then scroll down to David Applegate's movie version. And then you can play any of these you want. And there, there are quite a lot and they're well worth watching the videos. And um, I said that the, the first of these easy, is easy to understand. And just uh, as an educational um, point here, there are two sequences that underlie that. And one is the number of ones in the binary expansion of n, the binary weight of n. You know, when you write one in binary, it's just one. When you write two, it's one zero, and it's got a single one in it. When you write three, it's one one, it's got two ones and so on. So this is the number of ones in the binary expansion of n, a very important sequence. And closely related is the highest power of two that divides n. So for instance, uh, one, two, three, four. Four is divisible twice by two. Uh, five, six is only divisible by one, by uh, two once. Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is two by two by two. You, you can divide two into eight three times. So this is a very closely related sequence. This goes, you can sing this. It goes 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, 3, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, 4, and so on. There's a, a, a simple pattern. And the, uh, the first of those uh, cellular automata is um, the number of ones that's turned on at each generation is essentially the first of these sequences, rescaled. Now, um, I, there's a, a question that I think is very basic, and it could have been asked by anyone at any time. Archimedes himself could have looked at this question. How many ways are there to draw one, two, three, four, and so on lines in the sand? So here's Archimedes. Um, just before he was killed in, uh, by a Roman soldier in Syracuse in 212 BC, drawing in the sand. He, he was the most, <laughs> the, the greatest scientist of that, of its century. So here's the question. How many ways are there to draw lines? How many ways? So, uh, how many ways are there to draw one line? Well, you could draw it vertically or horizontally. You could make it thick or thin. You can make it black or blue. But there's really only one way. So, one line, one way. What about two lines? Well, okay. The way uh, the way I'm looking at this question, you could have two parallel lines, or you could have two lines that meet. Two lines either are parallel or they cross. I don't care what the angle is. I don't care how far apart the parallel lines are. There are two ways. And these parallel lines never meet. We're, we're not doing projective geometry here. This is just ordinary geometry in the sand. Two lines, there are two ways. Three lines, they could three be parallel. We could have two that are parallel and one crosses them, or three lines that meet at a point. Or we could have three lines that never meet at more than two points in general position. And so there are four ways to do three lines. For four lines, um, they could be four parallel lines, three with a crossing, two pairs of parallel lines, and so on. Uh, if we had a pair of parallel lines and two other lines, they could meet. And the meeting point could be between the parallel lines 
or outside the parallel lines or on the parallel lines. And then uh, if there are no parallel lines, th there are three more ways. So that um, makes nine ways. And the question is in general, how many ways are there? Well, we don't actually know much about this question. Um, it's easy to do five lines by hand or 47 ways. Six lines, I wouldn't like to try it by hand, but the answer is 791 and uh, six, seven, seven lines, 37,830. This is probably a doubly exponential sequence, but we don't know. We don't know the answer for eight lines or more, and we, there's no formula. And you can see what we know about it by uh, looking at the, the online database of sequences, looking up at entry 241600 to find out more about it. And then you're probably going to ask me, what about circles? Well, we know even less about circles. And um, we know the first one, two, three, four, five terms. And again, it's growing very fast. And uh, there's a video that uh, Brady Haran and I made called How Many Ways Can Circles Overlap? It's on YouTube number file channel. Uh, it's already been viewed one million, <laughs> one and a quarter million times. And um, so I won't say any more about it. Um, so here's a really interesting puzzle that came up. It was suggested by two undergraduates at Michigan State, um, uh, Laducier and uh, Rebenstock. And here's the game. I think this is really astonishing. So the game is you have a squared grid and um, you start off by putting down two or three or four, some fixed number of ones. So here's what you do if there are two ones. You put down two ones in this grid. And then the rules are you can put down a two. You try to put down a two and then a three and then a four, but you can only put down a two if the sum of its eight neighbors is two. So we've got two ones and then the two. Yes, we can put a two there because it's got its neighbors add up to two. Then we've got a one and a two, so we can put a three there. We've got a one and a three, we can put a four there. Then we can put a five and then we can come back down here and put a six because we've got a three, a two and a one and a six and, and so on. And eventually you get up to 16. And it has been shown. In fact, the, the two students who suggested this showed this. You can't do better than 16 with two initial ones. But what if you have three ones and four ones? Well, um, what we know, it, I find it actually miraculous that people have been able to do this. We know the answer all the way out through six initial ones. And this is really very hard to imagine because even for putting down two ones, there are infinitely many places you could put them. Well, we know six terms. And Robert Gibitz found an upper bound. He proved that you can't get too many. It's that you, can, you can't, if, no matter how clever you are, when you put down six initial ones, you can never get to a million. There's an upper bound which is proportional to n times log n squared. And there's a lower bound, Andrew Howroyd found, which is very pretty. He said, look at the following construction. Start off with two ones, then you can put a two in between them, and then a three and a four and a five and a six. Then let us have placed, pre-placed a one here, and then we combine that six and the one and get a seven. And then we can go eight, no, nine, 10, 11. And then if we've pre-placed a one here, we can get a 12, 13, we get five more. So if we put the ones in a diagonal line, we can get five N minus four. And here is the optimal solution. That was just, Harroyd's was just a lower bound, but it shows you can always at least do uh, 5n minus 4. But here's the best you can do with four initial ones. You can get 38. And with five, sorry, with six initial ones, you can get to 60. Sorry, and quick question. 
So the sequence is the max over all of the possible initial configurations? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there are a lot of possibilities. <laughs> But for six, you can't get higher than 60. And if you look at the entry in the OIS, there are programs. This was mentioned on some Code Golf website, and there are C and Perl and Python programs. Um, so what happens? Uh, we'd like to know more terms. Um, all right, my next topic, you probably all know what Mersenne primes are. Mersenne primes are powers, uh, are primes, which are powers of two minus one. So for instance, 31 is two to the fifth power minus one, and it's a prime. And uh, there, uh, for a long time, uh, there's been work on this, going back to uh, Euclid, in fact, because these are related to perfect numbers. And the question is, what are the Mersenne primes? And the conjecture is, we think there are infinitely many. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time and computer time, probably millions of years of computer time working on this. There's a group called the, um, the, the GIMPs, the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search people. And they've so far, they've come up with 47 primes. These are the exponents. So two to the three minus one is seven, and that's a prime. Two to the seven minus one is 127, and that's a prime. Two to the 43 million dot, dot, dot minus one is a prime. It is a very large prime. It's probably the largest prime we know. Of course, we know there are infinitely many primes. We don't know that there are infinitely many Mersenne primes of this special form, but it will be very hard for any of um, people, any people watching this to find the next term, unless they spent a huge amount of money and time and hired lots of programmers and so on. Very difficult. But here's a poor man's version of the problem. So instead of starting off the powers of two, I'm going to start off with reversing the digits. So instead of going one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, I'm going to go 1, 2, 4, 8, 61, 23, 46. Instead of 128, 821. Instead of 256, 652, and so on. And the first thing that you could do, in fact, I was very surprised that this wasn't in the OEIS already. Take your ordinary binary representation of numbers. So 65, what's it in binary? Well, it's 64 plus 1. Reverse those numbers. Instead of 64 plus 1, it's 46 plus 1. So the 47, the 65th term is 47. Okay, that's a new sequence from the other day, sequence uh, 341705. And if you draw the graph, the normal graph of the integers, the normal graph of n is a straight line, right? That just goes up with slope 1. This is not at all a straight line. This looks like geese flying through the air or uh, akak shells trying to shoot down a Japanese plane or something. It's a rather unusual graph. Well, so the, the Enesrim primes, uh, the, the poor man's version, subtract one from the reversed powers of two and say, when is that a prime? Exactly. Yeah? Sorry, was there a question? Okay, um, uh, the, 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 take the reversed powers of two and subtract one. For which values of k is that a prime? Well, 13 works because if you take two to the 13, you get 8192, reverse it, 2918, subtract one, 2917, and that's a prime. So 13 is in the sequence. It's a sequence A341713. It's very new. And um, uh, in fact, I sent it into the database. There are seven, I worked out the first seven terms and Hugo, who is uh, watching, participating, found the next term. Uh, which is 16,000 odd. And I think he checked up to 62,000. He may have gone further. Uh, uh, 66,000 was. 60, uh, yeah. Well, but so, I, I then guess it was just one time of computer. Uh, so in a single core. But yeah. it, it's getting slow. 
but you could surely it won't be too long before we we don't know but it's a lot easier than finding another mersenne prime that's why I mention it. It's something that well, poor man, um, yeah. <laughs> so a poor man or a poor graduate student could easily uh, get this. Um, so an even more basic question, a really, really basic question. Look at the number that you get by writing one, two, three, four, five, six in a row. So look at the number one, two, three. And you say, hmm, is that a prime? Well, no, because it's divisible by three. One, two, three is three times 41. Um, uh, so um, what about one, two, three, four? No, it's not a prime, it's even. What about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13? That would give you this number, one, two, three. You, you just squash together all the decimal expansions of the numbers from one to N. If you stop at 13, you get a number which might have been a prime. It sort of looks like a prime, but it's not. It's not even or a multiple of three or five, but it is a multiple of 113. It's a product of three primes. It's a fairly typical random large number. And um, uh, so um, on the other hand, if you do the usual kind of heuristics, and estimate how many primes there should be in this sequence, you see that there are probably going to be infinitely many primes. So the sequence is the concatenation of the numbers one through n. That's actually sequence A7908 in the OEIS. And there are notes there about the search for primes. And the GIMPs people looked at this for a while. And I believe they checked the n up to uh, 344,000 and didn't find a prime. On the other hand, the, uh, the estimates are pretty convincing that it should be a prime before n gets to a million. But I think they've stopped because we're talking about factoring a number which um, <laughs> has a lot of digits. It, it has um, you know about six times three, four, four, eight, six, nine digits. It's a, a pretty large prime. So it takes a while to factor it or to, or to prove that it's not factor, composite, not factor. Compar to, to, no chance to, <laughs> decide yeah whether it's uh to run a primality <laughs> test i should have said right yeah. yeah yeah um so uh this is the most wanted sequence uh in the oeis and there's a poor man's version I suppose you don't start with one but you start with two and ask when do you get a prime well you, you get a prime pretty quickly if you start with two. Two is a prime, likewise three. What about four? Start with four and look at the number of 45, four, five, six, four, five, six, seven. Aha, four, five, six, seven is a prime. So we stop and we write down seven. That's the way you stop, that's a prime. Starting at five, you stop at five. Starting at six, six, seven, 67 is a prime. So you don't have to go far. Nine, you have to go out to 187 before you get a prime. But 10, we don't know. No one, not many people have looked at this. Chai Wa Wu checked for 10. He went out to 10,000 terms, but we don't know. That should not be so hard to find. All right, um, read Kelly. There's one sequence you surely all know, which is when you're breeding rabbits, Fibonacci's rabbit sequence. Um, uh, Fibonacci, you start off with, with one pair of rabbits, and after a month, they have a, a pair of baby rabbits. And uh, they also have baby rabbits after another month, and so on. So the sequence is the number of pairs of baby rabbits you have. It goes one, we wait a month, it's still one. And then the first... Um, uh, the, the next one, one of these one has a pair of new baby rabbits. So now we have um, we have two. Yeah, one plus one is two, and then it's one plus two is three. Two plus three is five. Each time, the um, a month later, the previous term gets added to the current. Anyway, so the, the, the rabbits breed in like the Fibonacci numbers. And the nice thing about this particular sequence, which by the way, goes back to Leonardo of, of Pisa, uh, Fibonacci in the year 1200, that there's a formula, an exact formula for the nth term. The Fibonacci, the nth Fibonacci number is essentially the nth power of the golden ratio, 1.618 divided by the square root of five. 
it's not exactly that. There's a tiny little deviation. But if you round that to the nearest integer, that's the Fibonacci number. OK, so those are the well-known Fib Fibonacci numbers. If it takes two months for a pair of baby rabbits to have their new babies, then we get Narayana's sequence, which is um, you get by starting 1, 1, 1. And then each term is the sum of the previous term and the term that's two back. So we get uh, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. And it grows like that. And it's very like the Fibonacci numbers. There's a, a very simple explicit formula for the nth term. Reed Kelly, in I think it was about 2012, said, OK, let's, let's not add to simply add the two numbers in Narayanas. Let's divide out by their greatest common factor. If the two numbers you're adding, like two and four, have a common factor, divide it out. So two plus four, two and four have a common factor of two, two plus four is six. Instead of getting six, we divide by two. We divide by the common factor and we get three. So this is the Reed-Kelly sequence. Uh, two plus four is three, three plus three, is six divided by the GCD is, is two. Four plus two is six. We divide by two, get three, and it goes like that. And if you look at a graph of this, it looks very strange. Um, on the log scale, when you look at the graph of the Fibonacci numbers on the log scale, it's a dead straight line. <coughs> it's just uh, you know the log of phi to the n. So it's n times log of the golden ratio. Here, look at this, it wobbles. This is really annoying because we don't know what the wobbles are. If you look at the nth root of the nth term, look at this. This is the plot of the first 350,000 terms in the nth root of n. What on earth is going on? It would be very nice to know a bit more about this sequence. Um, OK, my last topic is gerrymandering, which is of great importance because of the recent elections and other things. And until recently, there wasn't much in the OEIS about this. Um, but uh, very recently, uh, uh, Sean Shawnee sent in a sequence, 341578 now, and then Don Rebel improved, I mean, gave, gave us a, a generalization of it. So Sean Chorney's sequence is this. We have a, a town. Let me show you an example. Um, we have a town. And it's got, it, it's divided up into square houses. It, this, here's an example with 36 houses, 36 voters. And every house has a voter who votes, votes for either A, the party A, or the party B. And the question is, um, how many votes can you still win the election with? And this is a very artificial thing. It has nothing to do with real life. The, the way we set it up, the, set, the way he's designed the problem, we've got n squared voters. And we're allowed to divide them up into groups. As long as they're equal groups, we divide this town up into districts. And the, 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 the rules that we've imposed are the districts have to be equal. And to win the town, all you have to do is win a majority of the districts. So we've got 36 voters, and we divide them up into three groups of 12. The way I've, uh, I'll go back, this, exa this example, yeah, in this example, um, B is going to win, the party B is going to win if they're allowed to do the redistrict, the re uh, drawing the districts, the gerrymandering. B is going to win with just 14 votes, even though the A party has 22 votes. And 22 is the minimum. I mean, 14 is the minimum. You need at least 14 votes to win, according to these rules. And if you have 14 votes, no matter where you place them. So I just put down 14 Bs at random in this grid. It, and then I drew the districts. I gerrymandered the districts. It's, it's called gerrymandering because of Governor Jerry in Massachusetts in the 19th century who drew districts look like salamanders. 
So this is that's why they're called. Uh, Do the districts have to be contiguous? Like, is this cyan district here in the no, middle a contiguous district? In this particular problem, there's no restriction like that. They could okay. be just totally disjoint. Of course, there are many other versions. And uh, so far, I don't really have any sequences based on them. Um, but here you draw them like this. The red district has been carefully drawn so that it's got seven B votes in it and only five. So they're all size 12. And we make sure that there are two districts where the B party has seven votes and the A party has only five here and here. And then this, this district, we totally give up to the A party. And the B party wins these two and uh, gives up on that. So with 14 votes and the power to do with the gerrymandering, uh, you can win. And the question is, what's the minimum number you need for N squared votes in general? And um, uh, Don Rebel worked out the analogous sequence when you have um, a general number of votes, but the, the districts still have to be equal. So it's, it, you look at the divisors of N. Here we've got 36 votes and we look at divisors. And I wanna mention that this recently, this court, this, this um, gerrymandering case became, came up before the Supreme Court who um, decided against doing anything about it. So, that was a loss for the people who care about the elections, which includes most of us. And um, th there were a number of amicus briefs filed in connection with this uh, Supreme Court decision that sh by people who looked at different ways to measure the gerrymandering situation. And uh, as a project for anyone watching this, it would be interesting to analyze these and see what they mean mathematically and are there sequences that come out of this. Um, and um, I've tried to show you that sequences of numbers are exciting and the uh, primary place to go to find out more about these sequences is the OEIS, oeis.org.